Hi all, my name is Richard Nugent. I'm an economist and the lead developer for the HEC FTA program at HEC. This series of videos serves as an introduction to flood risk assessment. In this video, we will take a look at the measurement of flood risk. Our approach to measuring flood risk involves hydrologic, hydraulic, and economic contributions to expected annual damages. Expected annual damages serves as our primary measurement of flood risk. Flood risk is assessed as the sum product of various flood events probabilities of occurrence times the consequences associated with those occurrences. But how do we model these probabilities and consequences? I will discuss how we model two measures of flood risk expected annual damage using HEC FDA and life loss in HEC FIA. But before I start, it is important as economists that you recognize that risk assessment is truly a multidisciplinary effort, which means that nobody gets to work in a vacuum. Engineering inputs that don't meet economists' needs are worthless. It is the duty of the economist to communicate what is needed from the engineers and the duty of the engineers to meet that need. FDA and FIA models that do not produce reasonable output metrics are the economist's responsibility. The economist must lead the investigation, explanation, and debugging of this input data and output results. Planners who do not understand the nuances of engineering and economic methods and models in order to guide the team are not really managing the study and should not lead the plan formulation. Let's look at the uh, different members of the multi multidisciplinary effort. The planner should also be heavily invested in understanding each person's contribution to the study goals. In a holistic view, planners should be competent enough of an engineer and economist with sufficient enough understanding of the models, such as RAS, FDA, HMS, such that the planners can help engineers and economists select compatible and cost-effective methods and models, for example, collecting a sample or completing a survey of the structured inventory using steady or unsteady hydraulics, using the rational method or SCS curves. The planner will define with the local sponsor and the project delivery team the water resource problem being solved. Is it a flood problem? Uh, do we, the Army Corps of Engineers, have the legal authority to address the problem as a federal agency or is it statutorily a local, state, or other federal ag agency's responsibility? The planner will also lead the team toward developing a scope of work, schedule, study objectives, and the study area boundaries. Later in the process, the planner will lead the team through the development of potential water resource solutions, which are the alternatives. Hydrologists study the spatial and temporal distribution of water. Hydrologists cannot say specifically if it will rain, let alone flood tomorrow or next year, but hydrologists can provide you with a probability that it floods. The output you're usually looking for is a probabilistic description of the annual peak flow of water in a stream at various locations within the study area for expected annual damages computations. For dam and levee safety studies, you are looking for the stream flow for a given event. You may be interested in an entire storm's hydrograph if you're concerned with life loss, regional economic losses, agricultural damages, or traffic delays. Hydraulic engineers study the physical properties of water, and in our case, the movement of water through open air channels and the floodplain. The output you're often looking for from hydraulic engineers is the stage the topographic elevation of water for a given or range of flows provided by the hydrologist. Sometimes you might also be interested in velocities and an entire hydrograph for dam and levee safety. 
the economists provide decision support information. You'll be studying the consequence, damage, or life loss associated with a given hydraulic condition, the stage, or the stage and velocity. You'll also be supporting the evaluation and selection of a plan, but we'll get there later. You are likely to depend on others to complete your analysis. In terms of risk assessment, geotechnical engineers describe the probability of levy or bank failure for a given stage, and water managers describe the operations at existing structures for a given or range of storm events. In the last video of this series, we will discuss how cost engineering and real estate come into play, but first let's discuss expected annual damage, or EAD, as a measurement of risk. Expected annual damage measures damages to structures and infrastructure as a result of flooding, which forms the basis for most planning level decisions. Now we have looked at briefly how each of these disciplines come into play for measuring flood risk. Let's look into each of these disciplines in a little bit more detail. Hydrologists may create a rainfall runoff model or perform a frequency analysis of flow records. For FIA, hydrologists will provide a hydrograph, the flow as a function of time relationship. For FDA, we model damages as a function of annual peak flow or stage, so just the top of the tallest hydrograph frequency, as illustrated using the dashed lines in the middle image. In other words, we are concerned with the relationship as in the diagram on the right, that tells us the probability measured on the x-axis that uh, given flow measured on the y-axis is exceeded in any given year. This diagram is simply a cumulative distribution function except that the x and y axes are flipped. A typical CDF would show probability on the y-axis as a function of flow. But we are looking at the probability that a flow is exceeded. In other words, the flow being greater than some value. A typical diagram will show the opposite, the probability of non-exceedance. The other unique thing about this diagram is that the x-axis is in reverse order, so that the graph is upward sloping with lower probabilities on the far end of the axis. So a flow with a 50% chance of exceedance in any given year, or about a two-year storm, has a low flow associated with it, and a flow that is only surpassed in 1% of years, or a 100-year storm, has a large flow associated with it. We ask hydraulic engineers to tell us, for a given flow, how high will the water be? This has to do with channel geometry. How much water can a channel hold? This has to do with topography. Where does water go in the floodplain? And this also has to do with things like channel roughness that affect the velocity of the flow. How quickly can the water be routed? Does the water rush by or does the water get stuck and back up? And now you get to see why we invert the flow frequency axes. For a given frequency event, such as a storm so large that 99% of events produce smaller flows, the 1% annual chance of exceedance event, we can calculate flow. And for a given flow, we can calculate the river stage, the water surface elevation or depth of flooding. And we ask economists to tell us for a given stage, or water surface elevation, how much damage would be produced. This involves tying together information from different sources. We start with terrain or topographic data, and this gives us ground elevations. The ground elevations are linked to structure locations, and this gives us the ground elevation at each structure. The structures have values, and we care about the structure's value in its current condition, which is the depreciated structure replacement value. 
structures also have other uh, attributes, such as structure use, which helps us to generalize some information about the value of the structure's contents, the structure's likely method of construction, and therefore susceptibility to damage. We also generalize some uncertainties and other point estimates, such as the number of vehicles at each structure using the structure's use. Finally, we collect information about the elevation of structures, which gives us the elevation at which water enters the structure. This information is linked to hydraulic data, which describes the depth of floodwaters in the floodplain. This accomplishes our main goal, which is the development of a percent value damaged stage relationship. This relationship can be applied to a wide range of events. The percent damage information generally comes from expert elicitation, direct observation, or a mixture of both. The depth damage information is aggregated by impact area or reach. For a given location where water breaks out and begins to flood infrastructure, we now know that for a given frequency event, how large the flow will be, for a given flow, how high the water will be, and for a given stage, how much damage there will be. You can now start to see how this Monte Carlo process allows us to analyze how uncertainties in the input parameters affect our output parameters, the damages. So let's follow this process through. Starting with a given frequency event, we calculate the flow. From this flow, we calculate the stage. From this stage, we calculate the damage. And thus, we can calculate the probability of a given value of damage. Let's back that up real quick. We calculate the flow from the flow exceedance probability function. And from that flow, we calculate the stage from the stage flow function, also known as the rating function. From that stage, we calculate a damage from the stage damage function. And that information gives us, together with the flow exceedance probability function, a damage exceedance probability function. This methodology importantly assumes that we can measure damage as a function of stage. The way that I just described FDA's calculation is the most intuitive way to understand the program and is sufficient for non-economists. However, we do not randomly sample events in FDA, we randomly sample curves. There is uncertainty about each of these relationships. So rather than look at an event at a time, we look at a curve at a time, and this makes our expected annual damage calculation seem more straightforward. Let's take a look at this. First, we randomly select a flow exceedance probability function. We randomly select a stage flow function, a stage damage function, and these three functions together produce a realization or an instance of a damage exceedance probability function, and the integration of which produces a realization of expected annual damage. Each time that we randomly select a different set of functions, we get a different damage exceedance probability function and a different realization of expected annual damage. Uh, what are some things that we can say about expected annual damage, our measurement of flood risk in general? Well, expected annual damage is a probability weighted average amount of flood damages that one would expect to experience in any given year without a priori knowledge about whether or not any flooding will occur in that year. 
since flood events are, by their very nature, rare events, expected annual damage will generally overestimate the damages occurred in most years, since there will be no damage in most years, while simultaneously underestimating the damages that will be incurred after most flood events. Let's consider an alternative that proposes building a dam. The dam would hold back flow near some town such that for large events or low frequency events, peak flows are reduced. This continues until the dam would become dangerously full, at which point releases would increase. For a given flow, the stage would stay the same. In other words, the river channel in this case has not been changed. For a given stage, damages are the same, assuming the dam does not encourage or discourage development. But because we have decreased the frequency of certain peak stages, we have truncated the damage frequency curve. This reduces the area under the damage frequency curve, which decreases our primary flood risk metric expected annual damage. Let's take a closer look at the measurement of risk using our dam example. The area underneath the damage exceedance probability function represents without project expected annual damage. This is damages before dam construction. After construction, we have reduced the frequency of damages, thereby reducing expected annual damage. The green area represents residual expected annual damage, damages we have chosen through risk management and policies not to reduce. This is residual risk. The white area represents the area of damages we have prevented. It is this damage reduction that describes the project benefit damages that folks would have to pay for in the without project condition that they no longer will have to pay for. Then there is the question, is it worth it? That is a risk management question. But how much does it cost us to reduce those damages? That is a cost engineering, real estate, and environmental question. If you have any questions about the measurement of flood risk, please feel free to email me, Richard Nugent, or post your questions to the discussion board.